Welcome to those who are watching by um, Facebook on live stream. We're <laughs> Adult New Bible Class ABC at New Life Community Church in Fair Oaks, California. We have just passed out a form, which I don't know if we can pick it up on the camera or not. It, it's a form to be filled out during this month of December. And when you think of something that you're thankful for, just note it down. And at the end of the month, look back at your list of the things that you're thankful for and give God honor and glory as you do remember that. And that is just an extra thing I wanted to have for our class this morning. And... Now I, 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 I'm going to start the lesson, and I pull the picture of what I call a guamo on off the internet. I don't have the kind of picture from Africa that I would like to have because we took them so much for granted we didn't take pictures of them. Uh, but I, I, I want to share this with you and. And a guamo is just a grass or a leaf roof with no, usually no walls or very small walls. And the people sit under them, uh, especially in the evening. Uh, they have a fire in the middle of the guamo and they sit there and they visit the, the men sit in the guamo, the wife are, over, are in what's called the mafika where the wife does the cooking and lady friends will come and visit in the Mafika, and the, the men will be in the Guamo. But when we were teaching in the Bible school at Andudu at the end of the school year when there was a new graduating class, I was director, and the two gentlemen who were teachers, we would call each student in one by one and give them a personal evaluation of their years in the Bible school and talk to them about the future and about their strengths and weaknesses. And one thing that, that took me by surprise as a new missionary was that the two teachers, Raphael and Makeka, on certain people, not everybody at all, one or two at a time. See, now, when you get out there in a church, you build yourself a guamo. Don't you just sit in your wife's mafika, because if you don't have a guamo, the men of your village won't come to see you. Because men don't go sit in the mafika with the women. That's where they cook. And the women in the Pafika bring the food to the man in the Guamo. And that's that's all part of the, the culture. And and I decided I, I decided to show you these two guys that oh, I haven't got it on the right setting. Okay, there's the Guamo. Here are the two teachers. This is back in, oh my, this is back in the 70s for the Makeka, who was one of the Bible school teachers. And then Raphael, who I saw in 2008, my last trip to, to the Congo. By this time, he was very frail and, and weak, and it was so... So exciting for me to get to see Raphael. And here these two men had this very basic cultural understanding. And they saw weaknesses in a particular individual. And they would say, you need to have this kind of association with the men in your village. Now, I, I, I come up with another picture of Makeko. And, and I hope this doesn't distract your attention too much. But here's a picture of Makeka. He's been out with his Ot-6 
and he got a monkey. Mm -hmm. And he brought it by for me to take a picture of his uh, success in hunting that day. Um, I, you may not even want to see that, I don't know. <laughs> the sad thing is that years later we were gone, we were back in the States, and he went out to kill meat for a, a camp meeting or a conference, whatever you want to call it. They needed food and he went out and he shot a Cape buffalo but didn't kill it. And went back the next morning to find it and instead it found him. Oh, no. And he died oh. as a result of having done that. And the sad thing is there was also a missionary back probably in the 30s who did the exact same thing, uh, missionary Lindo. Wow. Uh, but these guys had this, this basic understanding of, of what needed to be done. Oh, I wish I had this in a different order. Like, like those two guys said to those students, now you need to have that fellowship. This fellow that you all know, one day I, I had gone to breakfast at, I think it's Annie's, mm -hmm. um, I was invited and I went and he was there and as we were going out, Ken said to me, you need to do this for the men in the Sunday school class. And now if I can get back to the right. There. Yeah. We, we have a group of guys that meet on Thursday mornings at sunrise in Old Auburn. And it really is just <laughs> our wobble. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> Conversation with no agenda. And that's how it is in a guamo. Whatever went by, a truck that went by that day, or somebody who'd been working in the garden, or you know, how soon planting season was for peanuts, whatever is discussed in the guamo. And that kind of happens at, at uh, <laughs> McDonald's as well, at the McDonald's Guamo. They just don't know what their restaurant is. <laughs> no questions barred? Are there, Andre? <laughs> Not necessarily answers, but questions are <laughs> Humorous or serious? We just get together and Enjoy ourselves with, with no agenda. Fellowship of brotherhood. And it's so neat. And all you guys who, who come, it's, it, it's such a blessing. I'm not in that picture because I'm the one holding the selfie. <laughs> and I didn't fit. There's a, a frequent subject questions that come up about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Through, through the months, every once in a while, this question comes up. And I just realized I skipped something, so I'll come back to this. In the Guamo, you sit in a chair like this. I went to the effort to get this here this morning. I don't want to skip it. And it always hits so that my arms usually go up above this part. And uh, sometimes we would pull up to a place and there'd be a guamo and, and you'd go and sit down and, oh, it's a white man. They'd go try to find a straight up and down wood chair for me to sit in. And I would race to get into this. Because I like uh, recliners. And this really works good. I know. 
it, you know, you take it. My brother-in-law, Leo, in 2002, when he went out there with me, he hired someone to make this, he bought it, said, make me a chair and I'll pay you for it. So they did it for us while he was there and he's had it all this time. And recently he gave it to Charlene and this morning I called Charlene and said, where's that chair? I want to take it because you just fold it up like this and you go on back to your house. Isn't that clever? Yes. So when, when we were going to come home, and when I called Charlene, she wasn't sure where it was. And she says, well, what about the little one you used to use when you were itinerating? I forgot about it. Remember Raphael in the picture? Yeah. The little guy that I had my arm around? Yeah. When we came home in 1974, one day we were getting ready to, to leave. He came and brought me this. Because he knows that in America you have to tell people about your work in, in Congo, in Zaire at the time. I, I'd never seen a love seat before, but that's what this is. See, it's there, there's two oh. of them, oh. Oh, husband yeah. and wife. That's cool. And he made he made this one uniquely for me to bring home, because you know it was his thank you for our our time there, and it was. So special, and everything is the same. Apparently, there are people who have the the love seat, even though I haven't seen one. Um, but um, these are for the Duomo. Now, do you think Thursday I should show up with that one? <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's seats aren't much better, but. Uh, <laughs> Now, back to where I'm supposed to be at this point. We started many <laughs> moons ago, Peter. <coughs> and two weeks ago, we were in, in Peter chapter 2, and we talked about, I will test you with the measuring line of justice and the plumb line of righteousness. And we showed that the plumb line Things are to be straight and righteous. And we talked about it being different individuals. And you notice that, that it, when I randomly put these names in, that I put Glenn under me. Uh, maybe you don't remember saying that, but you did. And you thought it was funny back then. Uh, but we stopped the lesson right there and did not go on to my next slide, which is about the gifts of the spirits and how they all work together to build the church. And they've got to be in line and in, in, in measurement with righteousness. Yes. And you can have these kind of things and be unrighteous. Oh, no. Yes. And I, I'm not going on to talk about all of those things today, but I really have felt like I needed to talk about this subject that keeps coming up in our Thursday discussions with questions that never seem to be satisfied. And I, I hope I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Glenn pass it out this time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have conversations. <laughs> Wore me out. <laughs> Got your exercise for the day. Yes. I, I want to talk to the, about the one gift in particular of tongues, because it's the one that has come up not every week, Thank you. but fairly often. And... I, I am giving you this, this handout. There's three pages on the, well, I'll wait till you get them. There are two types of speaking in tongues. The gifts are often in the plural. 
when it talks about the gifts of healings, it, it talks in the plural. There are individuals who have a gift for praying for one type of thing and others who have a gift for praying for other kinds of things. And I, I don't understand all of that. I just know that the Holy Spirit distributes severally as he wills. But there's this confusion where people Maybe hear they tongues, can, yeah, they, can they think in the singular, and don't understand that there's more than one use for the tongues. There's the personal private prayer, which the charismatic movement gave us the term prayer language. The second is the gift of messages in tongues which must be accompanied by the gift of interpretation in public meetings. The private prayer is that. It's private prayer and it's not interpreted. The gift of messages in tongues must be interpreted. And we're going to look at that on this, these pages that, that I just handed you. We're not going to try to to read everything on there uh, for you to take home. But about the first, the first one, as we said, personal private prayer. And this is non-interpreted tongues. Acts 2, 4, the first time we ever see this, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the <coughs> Spirit gave them utterance. In Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit <coughs> fell upon those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. For they, they knew they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit because they spoke in tongues like us. In Acts 19, 1, and it happened that Paul came to Ephesus, finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, some people would be offended. They're talking to some Christians. They're believers. And say, did you receive the Holy Spirit? What do you mean? I'm saved. Yes, you're saved. But have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And so... Here, you have people who receive, and they receive this prayer language that is not being interpreted, but they receive it as they are receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or being filled with the Holy Spirit. They already have the Holy Spirit with them, they, the Holy Spirit when they're saved. But now this is a new in in filling and endowment of power. Now the classic gift, I, that's my term, gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, there are diversities of gifts. See the plural in there? But the same Spirit. Yes. There are differences of ministries but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Word of wisdom, that's one. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings 
by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So here we have seen the prayer language, the personal prayer in the Spirit, which is a sign of the baptism of the Spirit, and then is, it is a a wonderful empowerment in your personal prayer life when you your English is not sufficient in my own case my Bangala is not sufficient there, there are many times I'm praying and I go into Bangala and that still doesn't do it and then I go into tongues and suddenly there's a release and this is not when anybody else is listening this is only between me and God, as you'll see on that list. And then there's the classic gifts, which are the messages in tongues for the edification of the church. The edification of the church. Now, if someone this morning were to give us a message in tongues, and an interpretation, it would be to bless all of us. If someone simply feels, as is described in, in, in the pages I gave you, you simply feel like you want to pray in tongues, but it's just between you and God, it says, pray to yourself. Because it's between you and God, it's not for the edification. And if you feel that you have a message, then you need to pray that God will give you the gift of interpretation or that there, you may know that there's another person present who has the gift of interpretation and one person gives the message, another one gives the interpretation. When we were in Riverside for several years, there, was, there were two couples who came to to our church. They'd been going to another church and they started coming on Sunday nights and they came and they said, are we allowed to have the gifts of the Spirit in your church? Well, of course. This is a Pentecostal church. And they began coming to the church and as it, as it turned out, this one lady had a marvelous gift of tongues. Messages in tongues. And the husband of the other lady had a wonderful gift of interpretation. And many a service, the one lady would give a message. I, I, would, I would be leading the service and, and I would sense that God wanted to say something. And I would kind of pause. <coughs> and she said, Sharon, do you remember her name? What? I remember about my name. No, I mean the name. I, I won't say her name, but I can't think of it. She would be waiting for me to pause because she sensed that God was in this. And, and I would pause, and she would give a message in, a message in tongues. And then virtually immediately, that other man would interpret what she had just given. And there were times, not every time, but times when then... The Lord would give would give me an, an, an ad, exhortation exhortation that went along with the things that were just given in the message in tongues Inter, interpretation and then I'd give an altar call and people would come to accept the Lord from the message in tongues interpretation. And then maybe an exhortation by the pastor that went along with exactly what had just been said by the Holy Spirit. And I have to tell you, that's the most beautiful 
kind of service you can yes, ever amen. be in. And I, I've seen a Sunday morning service where we, we would end up with three altar calls in one service. That was the exception. But it happened because the Lord was working in people's lives in such special ways. I remember the, the one couple that, that came <coughs> to pacify someone else and ended up their whole family got saved out of these messages. Hallelujah. Uh, and as as you let's see what's next. Now concerning spiritual gifts, gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. That's how it starts off in First Corinthians twelve where where it lists the, the gifts. And I, I've given you these these three columns, and I haven't explained them to you yet. Unfortunately, that thing across there is going to stay there. You know, I can do just a slight amount of work. And, and you got rid of it. Okay. You definitely got rid of it. <laughs> open, open, open. The left hand column. I have no idea what went wrong here. The left hand column is New King James, the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and it's the entire, the entire chapter. The second column, which happens to be mostly in blue, which has no, the color has no significance, only talks about the gifts of the private prayer language. The what is it? Kind of prayer language. Prayer language. It, the, the the personal prayer, where it's not for public consumption, it's between you and God. The third column is only about the gifts for the edification of the church. You're back. You're back. Turn around. <laughs> there, there, there are... The kind of questions that we get on Thursday mornings are, are the kind of questions that come <laughs> that come by people looking at at things that are talking about the messages in tongues and confounding it with private prayer. And I have gone through and lifted out beside each verse which place it goes now in, within this there's also prophecy I've not I've not highlighted prophecy because that's not been one of our uh, our topics but as you read it you, you it, he says I wish you all spoke with tongues and then a little later he says I'd rather say five words in an own language than 10,000 words in an unknown language. And the, the middle column, which is quite a bit longer, has quite a bit of critique in there 
about praying in tongues when it's not your personal prayer language, but publicly. And none of this is Sturgeon version other than separating out which tongues it's talking about. And I, I need to say, it may be when you take this and look at it, you may say, oh, I, I think that ought to be over in the other column. Well, okay. Uh, I'm not disturbed by it. You say, well, I think that applies to messages, not to private, or vice versa. But understand why you're deciding that it should be in the other column. I, I, I have done things like this before. And I have to admit, I really have to work at it to evaluate, okay, now is this talking about a message in tongues or is this talking about private prayer? And my hopes is for, for those who have had questions that you will be helped by these two columns to understand the difference remembering that that these gifts are plural in nature like gifts of healings I, I remember when I was in Bible school Oral Roberts came one Sunday to chapel and he had a prayer line and was praying for people and one one man who was a great deep voice bass singer was blind and he went up there to be prayed for by Oral Roberts, thinking that maybe this is going to be when I'm healed. And Oral began to pray for him and said, he stopped and he said, you were born with this, weren't you? Yeah. He says, I don't have the gift for healing those who are born with a given problem. Oh, wow. And he simply realized he didn't have that gift. He had a gift for praying for lots of people that came in the prayer lines and many were healed. But, but there's a uniqueness. And these gifts are, are to bless the congregation. And oh, what a blessing they are. But we must not superimpose one upon the other uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> I ask you questions and then give this back. I don't know. Uh, okay. I, I have... When growing up, it, it was almost seemed like every Sunday night there was a message and interpretation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uncommon. You hardly ever hear it anymore, sir. Why do you no, think no, that is? Yeah, that's not good. They get away with Sunday nights. Yeah. yeah, you know, Sunday night, Sunday mornings. Boy. Yeah, that's true. But you don't, there's not, you, you don't hear it very church. often. Good point. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I mean, uh, Sunday nights is when our revival started. Sunday nights were when you really sought the Lord. But then the Ponderosa came on. <laughs> you remember that was Sunday night? Bonanza. Yeah. Bonanza. Yeah. yeah. And people started giving that a priority. Well, surprise, surprise. You put your priority somewhere else, and those blessings are going to evaporate. Yeah. I wonder if you, uh, you know, church service, and you think you feel led to speak in tongues and the Bible said you need an interpreter. I just you said you do it in the church service. Right? But I guess to have confidence that somebody is going to be in, there to interpret is just a matter of faith, I guess. Huh? No. It's a matter of one, pray that you will receive that gift so that you know there's an interpreter there. And two, 
Like, for instance, the example I gave of the one lady and her friend's husband, they knew each other were there. Or, at times, our former missionary brother Clark was in the church, and when he gave the interpretation, the whole building shook as if God himself were speaking. Brother Clark had, had an anointing on his interpretations that was just, just amazing. So, you need, if you're giving an interpretation, a, a message in tongues, you need to know, is there someone there? Uh, or keep still. That's what Paul said right there. Uh, there was another, Bill? Uh, we're talking about speaking in tongues. Why do we need speaking in, in tongues? It's because, well, uh, I believe it was Paul spoke of how the bit in the horse's mouth directs the horse. It, 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 when, it, when the bit's in, your, in its mouth, it gives him. Your tongues are like having the bit in your mouth. Uh, when you're going through life, I like it as driving your car through life. And when you get saved, you receive salvation. You have a guest come to into your life or a passenger comes into your car of life and he is an advisor he doesn't he's too polite to take over but when you go in and you have uh, you you seek the tongues or you don't seek those tongues you seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you receive it and you speak in tongues that's giving over to the to the Holy Spirit the controls Given him, literally given him the steering wheel of your life's car or uh, such. And it's not a one-time experience. As you go through life, and my wife is a good example of it, she's learned to drive since we were married, and she's a good driver, but sometimes I just get antsy when she, the way she drives, and she does the same with me. And we want to take that steering wheel back. We got to give it every morning. I, I say we got to give it to the Lord or give it to the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to take over by allowing Him, by and you do that by learning to speak in tongues. You're giving Him the bit in your mouth, the horse's bit, so to speak, in His in your mouth to the to the giving the steering wheel of your life to the Holy Spirit to take you through it. And you keep giving it because you get antsy and you want to take over that steering. And he's so polite he'll allow you to. You've got free will. Uh, that is something that God made is very important to God the Father. He knew when Adam and Eve went into the garden what was going to happen. But he, he, had, he gave them will, free will, to make that choice. And the Holy Spirit is the same way. He allows you to take the take that steering wheel when you want. So you have to keep giving it to him. That's what tongues is, is allowing you to do, is allowing you to turn it over to him. Now, some people may not agree with that, but they do. And, in, in, in speaking in tongues and for interpretation and stuff as that, that's a gift separate from the one that you have of giving control to God. Well, it all needs to be under his control. I, 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 I need, I've got just a little more I need to cover here. Different gifts, kinds of tongues with the interpretation is the equivalent as you see in verse 5 to prophecy. Accomplishes the same Thing as tongues interpretation it gives the message that the Lord wants to say and, and then you'll also see it, it, one place it says tongues are for the unbeliever well that's if they're interpreted and it brings the message like a message in prophecy but and this is where I kept worrying about what Bill was saying this 
the, the subject, the, 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 the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I'm not saying it right. So well, it, it's not, it, the thing I worry about Bill's steering wheel is, you say, well, I couldn't help myself. Paul says, yes, you can. If you know there's no one to interpret, keep still. Oh, but I couldn't help myself. <coughs> yes, you could. It's, the spirit of this prophet is subject to the prophet. It's, it, 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 it's there on your paper. Uh, and none of that is sturgeon other than the separating the columns. It's, it, it's the Apostle Paul. And then the prayer language and messages in tongues with interpretation, prayer language edifies the individual. Jim, you, you go in your prayer closet in the morning and you begin to pray in tongues. It edifies you. You can't even say it edifies them because it's, it's you and the Lord. But the, the message in tongues with interpretation in the service, in the church, whether it's a class like this or the big congregation in the sanctuary, wherever it is, the tongues and interpretation edifies the church. And you're part of the church, so it edifies you. Are you glad, Glenn? I picked on someone else. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> About time. Now, he's a part of the church, and he has the privilege of, of giving this message, and someone interprets, and we're all edified. And that word edify means built up, building. It's like, it, it, it's like Andre puts a foundation down, and he has his guys come, and they put all the studs and all that stuff on it, and they build the house, they built it up. That's what this word edify means. That's where you get the word uh, edifice from. Uh, so the one is personal edification, which you need. You need it all the time. And truth of the matter is, other gifts would also edify you. But it's specific here in, in that it talks about the, the gift of, of tongues, which you receive when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or message in tongues when, when you later receive this, this amazing gift. Um, let me end. Uh, Kara? Uh, I've heard also that people give, give tongues, they speak in tongues, and in that service, they will speak a language the language they speak, they don't know, but somebody there, it brings them to Christ. Because they hear God speaking to them in their language. Specific there's, languages. There's a story of a missionary that we knew when we got to Congo. This missionary and his family were there. His name was Ken Copy. He had, he'd gone to the field quite a while before us. And he'd gone to the language school in Switzerland, where all the missionaries at that point went for French study. And the first Sunday, he went to the French service, because when you're in language school, you go to the church, even, the, even though you don't understand a thing that's being said, and gradually you begin to learn. His first Sunday at the French church in Switzerland, he gave a message in tongues. And the, the, the students who'd been there for several months, they were upset. How did this brand new missionary know to give a message in French? Wow. <laughs> he didn't know French, but he gave a message in French in a French church. Praise God. Well, now that's a rare, rare yeah. exception. And it, it was quite a testimony to him. First, then he still had to go through the rigors of studying because, you know, that message was only for a number of seconds or minutes, and, and his French ability was back to being American, and he had to learn it like everybody else. Yeah.
Could I just mention that before the communists took over China, there was a Christian orphanage for the Chinese orphans. And during the chapel service, the Holy Spirit moved very powerfully and uniquely. And many of those children uh, who did not speak English, they spoke, you know, any idiot can learn Chinese if you're born in China and raised Chinese. You know, they spoke Chinese. But many of them were praising the Lord in English. Wow. And they had never learned English. So there's many stories. Yes. My, my mother was baptized in spirit and spoke in Choctaw Indian which my grandfather, he was quarter chopped on, he understood, and, and God was speaking to him through my mother's prayer. So, many, many, many stories of, like that. Yes. I'm not sure why somebody wants in here, but... Well, it's, they, I, think it's eight, they think it's nine o'clock. Is there another class There's here? not another class. There's well, they still think it's nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you. Okay. Not that I bet. Not that I'm bet. <laughs> oh, no. The story you told reminds me of one that, that I'm pretty sure I've told you about before. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I haven't told to the class. The Congo back in the 30s was the, the Assemblies of God churches were not doing well. There, there was no emphasis on Pentecost and the people in Springfield, that's our Assembly of God headquarters, sent out the two head guys to close the Congo field. They said, we're just getting nowhere. We've got too many missionaries invested there. We're going to send them somewhere that they can be more effective. And that's back in the days when you went by ship to, to over to the Mediterranean and then down the Nile River on a boat and, and eventually you got inland to, to our field. And, and they were having a general council session at the mission station of Batongwe. And it was the original place that we thought we were going to be, but we just went there from time to time as visiting ministers. But, but they came to Batongwe. When they arrived at Batongwe, the two big shots from Springfield, they walked into the church and service was going on. And here you had this, this church full of how can I describe it and still be politically correct? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Not anymore. These, these people who had no formal education at all. They, this is in the 30s. They didn't even know French, let alone English. The entire congregation was praising God in English. Hallelujah. Wow. And these men who came to close down the mission because it wasn't being Pentecostal enough <laughs> had to change their plans. Glory to God. For next month, they're going to be celebrating 100 years of, uh, of being a mission there in the Congo. Praise the Lord. Uh, but it has to be very much a move of the Holy Spirit. And How that happened, I know that when I went there in 2002, after I'd been stabbed eight times to try to kill me, to keep me from going, and I, I gave the seminar on the Holy Spirit like I have never. I, I, I preached Pentecost the strongest that I ever have in my entire life. And this, there was a the wife of one of the ministers who, who had some education and she told her husband that the people who came forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, she heard people praying in English. Wow. Now she didn't come and get me and say, hey, want to come there to this? And it was a few days later that he says, my wife said she heard people praying in English. Well, they still didn't know English there, to that extent. 
she recognized it from having gone to school and studied English. Um, but the whole point is, and of course, her, for, for that person, it was a prayer language. It wasn't a message. It, it was in the blue column. Um, messages in tongues with interpretation, edify the church, verse 12. Prayer language edifies the individual, verse 4. And if, if you really want to be edified, blessed by the Lord, let the Holy Spirit speak through you. Okay, I have no idea who it is that wants in here, uh, but I guess... They, there's a group that said that they have a meeting at 10 in here. <laughs> so I don't know what happened there. That's pretty back-to-back, -back, but yeah. So that's what it is. They're they're waiting for the, this room to... It's probably like this. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I've not seen anybody burst in the air with me. <laughs> Lord, we ask your blessing on this class, on those things that we've said. May it be that, that any who have questions as they look at this page, that it will help them to, to see what it is Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 14. Lord, may your blessing go forth with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.